Okay, this is a voice recording for the DNA replication section, uh, specifically chapter 16 in your book. Uh, we're going to walk through how DNA is organized, uh, how DNA is replicated, how DNA extends itself in telomeres, and then how DNA can repair itself if they end up finding mistake. So let's talk first thing about how DNA is organized. So as you can see here, we have the pyrimidines and the purines. Uh, there's always going to be a pyrimidine with a purine. Remember that purines are the double rings. So we have A and G, or the easiest way to remember this is if you understand chemistry, A, G, silver, pure silver is large and big, uh, whereas the cut, C, U, T, uh, are the pyrimidines. Think of uh, cutting yourself on a pyramid because it would be sh sharp. The other thing that you need to know is base pairing by Chargaff, and that is G to C and A to T. Uh, Grant is cool, awesome teacher, yeah. Uh, G C is three bonds, whereas A and T is two bonds. Remember, these are hydrogen bonds, so they can be broken uh, easily by an enzyme. Uh, also by heat, which we'll discuss more in chapter 20, where we're going to use heat to break apart the DNA strands in order to do a replication in a test tube as opposed to in a cell. Fantastic way that Kerry Mullins ended up discovering a way to replicate DNA in a test tube, yep. which we'll talk about as PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Down the sides we have a covalent bond between phosphates and sugars, as you can see here. And the big thing that you need to understand is that down the sides, uh, it is this covalent bond, but there's this 3 prime and this 5 prime that we need to really focus on. So let's talk about the 3 prime, 5 prime component. Where does this come from? Well, as you get it more into chemistry through your years, uh, specifically organic chemistry, you'll learn that the major chem the major carbon, I should say, off of a ring, uh, which in this case is attached in nitrogen base, is going to be your number one carbon. So each one of these carbons around the ring, except this because this is the carbon, it's an oxygen, here's your fifth carbon, uh, are all numbered. So since this one is the most important because here's the nitrogen base, this would be number one. And then we go clockwise around, number two, number three, number four, and then number five. So the reason that this is called the five prime end is because the five sugar is pointing upward. As you notice down here, the three prime sugar is pointing downward. Look at the right hand side compared to the left hand side. They are anti parallel. So even though they join together nicely, the other side is flopped over so that the three prime is pointing up and the five prime is pointing down. Now keep this in mind as I'm talking because when we do DNA polymerase, DNA polymerase has rules. One of the rules is that it adds five prime to three prime. So that means that the new piece that it lays down has to be the five prime end, and it's going to work towards its three prime. It will not go this way; it will go only this way. Uh, so there's some issues that we are going to discuss, and how that uh, the DNA replication model ends up fixing these problems with the multitude of enzymes. So uh, just understand this piece, and then once again, that it's obviously twisted. Uh, between Maurice Wilkins, Rosalind Franklin, Jim Watson, and uh, Francis Crick, we ended up figuring out the model of DNA replication, and, or not replication, but DNA's model uh, in 1953. So let's look at the direction and the model type that we end up seeing with DNA replication. Uh, we're always going to move into the fork. So as you see here, it's a fork, right? We not a fork maybe that you would eat food with, but it is a splitting, hence the fork. So we're going to move into the fork, and the side that ends up being five prime to three prime would be more of a uh, leading side, and the other side would be a lagging side. And we'll talk more about how we can identify that in the next drawing. But what uh, the work of Hershey and Chase and uh, some of the others ended up figuring out is that this is more of a semi-conservative model. Uh, Messelson and Stahl, more importantly, discovered that piece. And what we end up seeing is that 
the original template here, as you can see, is the conserved piece semi, uh, in that half of it is used as a template, and the other half is brand new. So every single time you replicate, you end up getting uh, a piece of the old strand. And when I say old, I mean relatively old, in that the last replication process, it was old. And now it's the old piece for the new replication process. So we're going to add in these new nitrogen bases and fuse them in to be complements to the old strand. And every single time we replicate, we're going to do this model to the semi-conservative in that nature that we have the old piece conserved in one side and the another piece of the old strand conserved in the other. All right, let's talk through some of the enzymes and some of the workings. Uh, one of the big players, obviously, is DNA polymerase. There are two DNA polymerases, but it, for all practical purposes for your test, you only need to know that it's DNA polymerase. There are two DNA polymerases that are kind of being represented in this. One is DNA polymerase 3, and one is DNA polymerase 1. This one here that is going primary in a uh, direction of laying down 5 to 3 is DNA polymerase 3. Whereas the one that would come in and uh, take out the RNA primers and replace them, that would be DNA polymerase 1. So first things first, we have the old strand that's all bound together, hydrogen bronze. We're going to use helicase here to separate the DNA strands. And then we have single-stranded binding proteins that aren't really enzymes, they're proteins, that hold the fork open for us so that it doesn't rehydrogen bond together. Now. We need to lay down new DNA nucleotides, so this has been nicely named DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase has rules, though. One of the rules is that it needs to have some sort of bumper right here that it can attach to. Uh, the thing that's going to add this bumper is an RNA primerase, or primerase, uh, which can add this RNA, that's what you're seeing here, red bumper. So farther upstream here, this is incomplete, farther upstream, you would see an RNA primer here laid down by primerase. But eventually, this piece is going to have to be replaced. The DNA polymerase can then bind in and roll down in the 5 to 3 direction. So that's what you see in 5 to 3 into the fork. This side would be the leading side. And since this side is an anti-parallel side, it would have to go 5 to 3 out of the fork. So the lagging side actually jumps in as far to the fork as it can and works its way out. And as this unzips, it's going to continue to, have to jump in as far as it can and work its way back to the last fragment that was there. So as you can see, there's going to be lots of little RNA primers inside. So we're going to have to remove those primers. So DNA polymerase 1, which you don't have to know, you just have to know it's DNA polymerase, will cut out this RNA primer and put it in with this DNA. So you can see here we have DNA and then DNA, but there's a break. So another enzyme, DNA ligase, will come in and fuse those together with a covalent bond so that we end up having this light blue continuous, kind of like on this leading strand, with this light blue continuous all the way through the fork and when we complete the whole process. Um, the pieces that you see on the lagging side, you do have to know, are considered Okasaki fragments. Those are big in understanding what side's leading and what side's lagging. Now, uh, understand that a fork right, is, is fine and all that you would start at one side and maybe work your way all the way to the other side. But DNA, especially our DNA, since we end up having six feet of DNA, if this was the six feet of your DNA here, two sides, old strand, you'd actually see bubbles opening up all throughout this strand to increase the amount of replication going on. So this side has a fork right here. And this side would have a fork, and this side would have a fork, and this side would have a fork. So they're actually, you'd replicate going this way, and you would replicate going this way. So if it's leading on this side of the bubble, then it would be lagging on this side of the bubble. So we, we could draw kind of like an imaginary dotted line down the middle of the bubble here. And we would go leading one side and lagging the other, which means it's leading this side and lagging this side. Just like this is showing half of a replication bubble. So just keep that in mind. It's a way to speed up the process. The body has lots of enzymes. It's going to try to optimize the time and collision uh, that all this stuff is happening. <clears throat> all right. Uh, 
big discovery by Dr. Blackburn was that DNA, every time it replicates, it ends up having this jagged looking shape. And the reason being is here, there was an RNA primer. So this was a leading side, and this was a leading side. And if you remember, DNA polymerase has rules. One of the rules is if it plays or puts down new DNA nucleotides, there has to be a bumper here of RNA. So when it goes to cut this out, there's no way to lay down new DNA uh, nucleotides. So your result is every time you replicate, this DNA fragment will end up getting shorter, shorter, shorter. What she noticed through lots of research is that younger DNA or younger cells, cells that are more stem cell-like, end up having longer pieces of DNA compared to those uh, in somatic cells that are older in age. So she started looking for enzymes, and one of the enzymes she found was polymerase. And polymerase adds all this nonsense code out to these ends here so that it keeps replicating, keeping the DNA young. So every time it replicates, even though it's cutting in, telomerase will add in some more nonsense code so that it keeps it at the same length. So maybe one of the pieces for our aging is the fact that our DNA gets shorter because all of our important genes, all those exons, those things that are really important to us, are actually on the inside here. So as we cut more into our sections of DNA, we might start cutting into genes that are really important and maybe causing malfunctions and mutations that are um, problematic to our, our way of life. So telomerase is one of those enzymes found in stem cells and germ cell lines that are, that are in younger stature. Uh, the other thing that we have found is that telomerase is active in cancer cells, making cancer basically immortal. Um, one, one of the stem cell lines, which if you have a chance to look up, uh, is HeLa. HeLa is a, a, a great stem cell line to look at. It's from Henrietta Lacks. Uh, there's a fantastic book by Rebecca Skalut out there for you to look at called The Immortal Life, Henrietta Lacks, where they talk about this stem cell, or this stem cell, this cancer line, ovarian cancer, I believe, uh, removed from this lady, un, unbeknownst to her, uh, and basically is still living in, in, uh, in labs all throughout the world, and we, we've developed lots of different vaccinations and protocols and whatnot because of this stem cell line, but it's continuing to growing, uh, even though it's not in anybody, because it's cancer and it has active polymerase. All right, last piece for this unit, then, is talking about how the body can repair uh, mismatches or thymine thymine dimers. Uh, here you have a bubble in our DNA. Uh, your body can actually work in and cut these out. So we're going to talk about that uh, in far, as far as this excision repair, this removal, but also in a mismatch repair where uh, for some reason we accidentally bound, uh, remember it's G to C, A to T. If we accidentally bound a G to T, that happens sometimes. We can cut out one of the nucleotides or replace it with the proper one. Uh, one of the new enzymes that you need to know here is nuclease. Nuclease is the cutter outer, as you can see here. Since there's pre-existing DNA on this side and this side, uh, DNA polymerase can jump in, lay down the proper stuff, and then since we can't make that final covalent bond, DNA ligase can come in and fix the problem here. So uh, nuclease, the last one of this unit that you really need to understand. I uh, hope this clears up any problems that you might have had with DNA replication and DNA organization. Uh, otherwise, look into your book, ask questions. Good luck.